Okay, good evening everybody or good morning, uh, good afternoon wherever you are in the world. Um, thank you once again for joining us um, today, wherever in the world you're calling from. Um, my name's Graham Canning, um, I'm from uh, People Centred Excellence. It's my pleasure to be hosting this webinar today. Um, this is the fourth of the webinars in our Out of the Crisis series and this one promises to be something very special I think. Um, so we've got the pleasure of introducing and talking with leadership coach, Japan study tour leader, lean consultant, speaker, and now author, Yay. Katie Anderson. Hi, Katie. Hi, Grim and Mike, good to see you. Um, we've also got this handsome chap who's joining me is my PCE colleague, Mike Dennison. Uh, some of you may remember Hi. Mike, you may know Mike. Mike presented an earlier webinar in our series on leading with questions. Um, Mike's going to help me run the webinar today and uh, join in the Q&A session at the end um, of Katie's presentation. So say a quick hi, Mike. Hi, good to be on it. Look forward to, looking forward to this. So, Can't wait, Katie, to see what you've got to say. Always for time. About certain lean leaders being generous with their time and finding time to help and support. And Katie just, um, you know, um, exemplifies that attitude. So we're really thankful for um, for the support she's shown us on this one. Um, so anyway, enough enough from me. Um, it's time to hand over to Katie. So Katie, over to you. Well, thank you, Graham. It was a, a really uh, amazing <laughs> intro there for you. And so I, you know, I don't need to introduce myself too much, although I will say that with the dozen chickens in the backyard, we uh, I, I've moved back into my indoor office here so that we don't uh, get interrupted by them. They have been very uh, loud in the afternoon, <laughs> in the afternoons or early, late mornings, which it's here in the San Francisco Bay Area today. And I'm really thrilled uh, to be here with you today in the lead up to the publication of my book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn, and share with you some of the background and context for what, what how we, this book came to be as well as some of the insights from Mr. Yoshino and from myself about how to become or be a better people-centered leader in service of developing a learning organization. Uh, and so at the bottom here, I've gotten really some more clarity on my own purpose over the last year and, and thinking about this and trying to articulate it. But it, my purpose is really about uh, helping people around the world to live and lead with intention. And I'll talk about that word intention in a, in a few moments but you're here um, as people around the world to really um, help me do that. And this is why a part, core part of who I am is about sharing knowledge, collaborating, and helping each other uh, get better as well so that we can make the world better. And the book will be out in July. So pre-order is available now. So I'll tell you more about that. But uh, a little background. This is a picture of my husband and Mr. Asao Yoshino and me on what I thought was going to be a once in a lifetime uh, experience back on just over five years ago. Um, fast forward or backward, rewind backwards, uh, the year before we had found out that my we had an opportunity to move to Japan for my husband's job. And uh, it was amazing. I've lived in, as, as Graham had mentioned, I've lived in many countries. In fact, the only place in the US that I've lived is the San Francisco Bay area. I've lived in Spain and the Dominican Republic in the UK. Australia and then and then Japan as well, and uh, I was really excited. Anyway, Mr. Yoshino, I met at a conference about six months before we moved to Japan. He said, and for a little context, for those of you who don't know who Mr. Yoshino is, he is a 40-year Toyota leader who worked in uh, Japan and the United States uh, in the 1960s to the early 2000s. He was John Shook's first boss at Toyota. John Shook being the former uh, uh, CEO of the Lean Enterprise Institute and the first uh, non-Japanese employee of Toyota Motor Corporation. He helped lead the training program for the joint venture called NUMI between General Motors and, um, and Toyota when Toyota was looking to expand and translate its, uh, its culture and, and production to the foreign markets. And he's just an amazingly generous of heart and thoughtful of mind leader. So he invited us to go to Nagoya, uh, which is about 90 minute train ride from, from Tokyo. And I told my husband, you have to take the day off of work. This is going to be a once in a lifetime opportunity. And little did I know that this, uh, this one day was going to be incredibly transformative in my life 
and and from uh, and Mr. Yoshino has shared with me too, and the friendship and relationship we've developed out of it. I've learned so much from him, and that was the genesis of the book. I when I first moved to Japan, I just as a as a lean practitioner and a coach who had just started, uh, you know, I've been working in healthcare organizations for years and had started my consulting practice. I thought what an incredible opportunity to be someone who had this uh, experience of practicing lean in the United States and other countries, but not, but to then go to learn from the source. And so I started writing a blog and Mr. Yoshino on this very, this day when we spent eight hours together, he, he said, no problem, you can write about anything of our conversations. And so that be, that first blog post became a series of what I called Lean Leadership Lessons and was the original sort of idea that morphed into the book that uh, will be coming out next month. And chronicling so much of Mr. Yoshino's 40 years of experience and also some really uh, valuable stories from a personal level about what it means to be a learner and a leader. Um, so, oops, I'm, I need to fast forward here. And um, Mr. Yoshino said to me, uh, you know, probably about six months ago, as we were wrapping up the interviews and the production of the manuscript, he said, I'm, I'm learning and relearning more about my life. And I think this is the real power of reflection and looking back. And I've, through this process of working intensely with Mr. Yoshino for the last two years, I've really come to appreciate how important the process of reflection is and i always knew that reflection was was important but that we that it's not that we, that we look when we think of the plan do study adjust cycle we often think of we start with plan but really it starts with that adjust that reflection that study so how can we learn from the past the things that happened and then adjust for the future and that can happen for the totality of our life or on a sort of a micro pdca um, cycle in our day but how can we reflect more deeply and learn and learn better. Um, I also wanted to bring up this quote. We Graham talked about my my extensive Daruma collection, and uh, here is a Daruma from Japan. There is a I got obsessed with them while we were living living in Japan, and they're a visual representation of setting a goal. So you can see this Daruma's eye here. It has its left eye filled in, and when you have a goal, you set that in, and you know that you're going to get knocked down that you're not always going to be a linear course to achieving your goal. And so these are weighted. It's a little hard to see here, but it's, it's weighted at the bottom and it will always write itself back up. So how do we have the perseverance to keep getting up, to trying, reflecting, adjusting, and learning? So that's really sort of what, why I came to really love um, the concept of Darumas. And so the, the key, one of the key words in the title of this is intention. And the word intention has always been a very meaningful word for me. How can we be a purposeful and intentional leader and how we live our lives with intention? When I moved to Japan, I asked, I didn't have a business card and you have to have business cards to whenever you meet people, especially in a, in a more of a professional setting. So I asked the business card company to put my, uh, put the word in Japanese for intention on my card. And I sort of used that at the time as my logo. And this is what it came back to uh, saying. And as I started to hand it out, it's pronounced Shiko, as it, I started to hand it out, I learned that it comes from the, the symbols that make up this word come from three sub symbols. And the lower part of this left, left one means heart and the right, the ko means direction. And I just came to see this as having a, a much deeper meaning for the word intention. And, and I've taken this now, how can, we, how can we connect with our heart? What's really important inside of us, our purpose, and then align, our, align ourselves in that direction. So um, it's about having awareness about what's important inside, but not just having that awareness, but taking action and moving towards that and reorienting ourselves uh, towards that. So for me, this is what leading and living with intention is. It's about knowing our purpose, what's important, and then taking the actions that move in that direction. One of the things that Mr. Yoshino said to me, and I think this is a quote from one of our very first meetings uh, that, I, that I, I pulled out in an early blog post, is that he says the thing that really stands out for him about Toyota is that respect is about we make people while we make cars, and you know we it's it's the focus on people centered leadership. It's not it's in, of course in service of delivering value to your customers, but first and foremost, it's about developing people. And I was really struck by um, for those of you who haven't read Akio uh, Toyota's end of year speech, which was in uh, the end of financial year, which is in April. 
speech. I, rec I recommend you do. And at the end, uh, John, sorry, uh, he says that the new mission for Toyota is about producing happiness and about, in a, in, and I take that as joy and really focusing on uh, that, that, that respect for people and the things that bring us happiness and joy in life. And one of the things that is respectful is about developing people. And that can bring us happiness as we can be fully realized into our own capabilities and confidence for doing whatever it is that we, that is our purpose um, in this, in this world. So I do recommend uh, taking a look at that at speech. It's pretty, it's pretty special and powerful. And Mr. Yoshida, and then to connect this people-centered leadership concept to learning, Mr. To Mr. Yoshino uh, often talks about the only secret to Toyota is its attitude towards learning. So we often think about, oh my gosh, there are all these tools and principles and practices, um, but those are in service of a greater purpose. And it's about creating learning. And that concept of reflection is such an important part of how we learn and adjust. And that Toyota people are more patient for learning. Uh, my observation too is just in trying to um, practice lean in healthcare organizations here in the West or other working with other industries too, is that we're, we're under so much pressure and we don't feel like we have the time to slow down to do problem solving. So we have all these Band-Aid solutions that are, that are put on in the service of we don't have time. So having the patience to learn and the patience to develop people's learning capabilities is the real secret of Toyota. And I, uh, I also wanted to link this to the concept of developing culture. And this, this quote came out of when Mr. Yoshino was talking about how he was put tasked with developing this training program in Japan for the, the NUMI leaders who were coming to learn the Toyota production system, the Toyota way. And he originally was tasked with, you know, change their, change their culture. And he realized that we can't change their culture, but what we can do is provide experiences that allow them to learn and then open up to being able to change them. The screen. It was <laughs> for a moment. Uh, it's about how do we help each individual person have experiences that allow them to learn. And so as we go through the rest of the, the session here today, and we'll have time for questions. And, and if there are more questions we're not able to answer today, uh, we've talked, uh, Graham and Mike and I have talked about doing a follow-up session to um, answer some questions. So please continue to put your questions in the, in the chat box as well. Uh, but we're going to talk about how we, what are some of these le uh, these leadership practices that can help support not just the culture of learning, but also real people oriented, people centered uh, leadership that that helps create this concept of happiness and engagement in our in our communities in our world. So. Rewinding a little bit too to that first time I met Mr. Yoshino. This is before I we moved to Japan at the conference. I was sitting. I was. It was. It was total serendipity that I happened to be at the conference and that Mr. Yoshino happened. He wasn't originally planned to be at the conference, the Lean Coaching Summit in Long Beach, but he happened to be in California at the time. And John Shook called him up on the phone and said, "Hey, why don't you come and come on the stage with me, and we can talk about our experiences of working together with you as my boss and me as uh, as your subordinate, as they would call, as they called it in at Toyota." And they told some really funny stories. And <laughs> Mr. Yoshino was actually talking about how he had forgotten his underwear and was driving around looking for uh, Walmart or something when, when John Chuck had called him. So I already knew this was not a, uh, a stoic or it blew away all my preconceptions of what uh, a Toyota leader was uh, or a sensei was like. Anyway, they were up on stage and he said some really profound things as well. And this, this comment, has really struck me and has stayed with me since then and, and is the foundation of how I talk about um, leadership. That his aim at, when as a manager was to give John or whomever was working for him a mission or target, a challenge, and supporting him while he figured out how to reach that target. And, and as I was developing him, I was aware that I was developing myself as well. And this really is, I can sum it up, that a leader's role is to set the direction, to provide support, and to develop yourself. And if you can do those three things, then you're really going, you're really a people oriented, people centered leader. And also you are going to create a system and culture of learning because you're not rushing in and doing all the problem solving yourself. You're providing the support that allows people to develop those learning capabilities at all levels. And it also requires you to always be thinking about how you're getting better as a leader in service of setting the direction and providing support. So, 
if you go to the poll, this would be the time for, for you to reflect for yourself on how much of your time is spent on these three key leadership capabilities. So I'm going to talk about some different uh, practices that underlie or that are part of each of these three components, as well as a few tips at the very end that I've learned from my own practice about how, how to practice and create those habits. So first, um, the leader's role is to set the direction. So to provide a challenge, a, a goal, a target uh, that help align people into what's most important in uh, to achieve. I have found in working with organizations and leaders and groups that so often this part is missing in our organizations. We make assumptions that people know the direction or know the target. This was not assumed at Toyota. And in many ways, if you think about it, for those of you who practice A3 thinking, it goes with background, current condition, um, the problem and the target. The target's way down below because the target was clear. We need to start with the target. Where do we need to go? What is the direction? What is the challenge? And then understand what's the current condition and then we can define the problem. So uh, one thing that came out of my discuss discussions with Mr. Yoshino is a real understanding that targets also should be determined by what is needed to deliver value for our customers, uh, not by just what's achievable. I can't tell you how many meetings and uh, you've probably been in the same place before as well, that I've been in with leaders and organizations talking about uh, targets that are tied to bonuses that um, we, we need to like adjust the target so it's a little bit more achievable and getting really granular on, oh, uh, do we think we can hit this target or not? Because our incentives are maybe not aligned with actually creating uh, targets that are really about what is needed. So I encourage you too to think about how uh, do the systems and structures that we have in our organizations uh, inhibit us from actually setting challenges. Because as Mr. Yoshino says, it's the lessons from not reaching your targets that actually make you smarter. So we go back to the, what he said earlier about the only secret to Toyota is its attitude towards learning. It's about this as well. It's about how do you set the target so that you're always learning, you're never quite, uh, quite reaching it and getting there. And it's about the process of not getting there that you can reflect and learn and adjust. And it pushes you a little bit higher as well. Um, I was, I've been working with a group in, in the US as well uh, recently, and we've talked a lot about how it's not about, it. so this, this group was having, didn't, didn't know the target actually from their organization. And so we spent a lot of time talking about how can they get more clarity on the target as well as not getting stuck about finding the perfect target. It's better to be directionally correct and then to keep learning your way towards that because sometimes you discover what the, the actual precise target is uh, through the learning process. Something that's been really important for me too is for us to, to recognize that it's not, uh, leadership and coaching is not just about always providing the challenge. It's a balance between this concept of challenge and nurture, setting the direction, setting a target that maybe is a little bit out of range, that feels a little uncomfortable, but also providing the nurture and support so that people don't feel like they're flailing. So uh, that, that there is someone there who's going to help them. There is a safety net that there is a, a process to help them and someone there. And so as leaders and as people and as coaches, I mean, I think about parenting as well. How do we how do we challenge people to grow and develop, but also provide that support? And it's always just the fine balance about how we can do both at the same time. And uh, I've been spending some time talking about this concept a lot, particularly in the pandemic when uh, we've had so many challenges, how can we also be there to provide nurture? And that's a really important role of our of our people of being a people centered leader is connecting with the heart as well. So the second uh, part of people centered leadership is about providing that support. So what does that look like? There are a lot of different things that you can do, and so I'm just highlighting a few here. And we uh, we share so many different stories from Mr. Yoshino's 40 years at Toyota in the book, uh, but I want to highlight a few here for you and some of my own thoughts as well. And uh, I like this quote from Mr. Yoshino. He says, my role as a leader was to help others develop themselves. So again, we can't ever um, change someone's culture or change them, but we can provide them the experiences and um, create the conditions that allow them to learn, develop, grow, and to change. Uh, so the second thing that a people-centered uh, leader can do is to set 
the conditions for success and to take responsibility for when mistakes happen. For those of you who have heard some of my uh, webinars before talk about uh, talk about this book. There's a there's a story in from that Mr. Yoshino shared that he actually hadn't thought of in years and years. It was came out during our first interview almost two years ago when we had sat down for purposeful conversation about this book, and he was laughing remembering this about what an incredible experience it was for him. It's about creating the conditions for making mistakes, and this is so this this actually ran through his whole career at Toyota. like a failed business uh, venture that he led that lo lost Toyota $13 million at the end of his career and that we go into detail with about in the book. But this, this experience that he had, and part of his orientation was to go work and office role um, that really didn't have anything to do with the, the shop floor. But they wanted people to learn what it was like to be working at Toyota. of the people. So he was assigned to the paint shop in the Motomachi plant and he he claims it was a he says it was a very boring every few hours do it again as it ran low. Well one day um Mr. Yoshino uh who was actually Yoshino Kun at the time, which is the diminutive for like you know, child, uh, they turned to him and said, what happened? And I think in most situations, I think about if this had happened in almost any other organization I've been in, people immediately would have started uh, blaming the person or yelling and saying, you know, what happened? What did you do? And have some anger. But no, they paused and they, they asked him to uh, describe what he did and show what happened. And after they did, they realized that he it was it was clear that the the paint cans hadn't been labeled very correctly. So not only did the the managers not blame Mr. Yoshino, they turned to him and thanked him for making the mistake because it gave them an opportunity to create better conditions. They took responsibility that they had not labeled the uh, created any standard work or had labeled the the uh, the paint and the solvent clearly and so it was easy for him to make a mistake and so now this gave them an opportunity to see that that was um, an error or a, a, a gap on their on their behalf and that they had not created the conditions for him to be successful at work so uh, I, it was a really powerful experience for him and he said that happened across all of his cohort in his training session people are putting wrong bolts into cars and and whatnot but they had quality you know quality inspections but this gave them an opportunity to see where the gaps were in creating the conditions for people to do work correctly and with high quality. The third thing uh, that I, and this is, I talk about so much when I'm, when I'm working with leaders and coaches is that as leaders, you don't own the process for learning, or sorry, you don't own the outcome, you own the process. So this is where we don't tell people, it, we set the challenge, but it's about providing the support and helping them think about how to go about tackling that problem. It's about teaching them the process of learning and creating the conditions for learning, uh, not us jumping in and giving all what we think are the right answers. So this requires patience to have to teach the process uh, and patience for not having the answer right now and immediately. But if you go back to the secret at Toyota, this is what they do really effectively. They have built in this expectation for their leaders to give time for learning and to support them. So when, one example from Mr. Yoshino's time is that, you know, fast forward about 10 years, he was now in the, to the Tokyo office and he'd spent a few years in the Motomachi plant learning how to go to Gemba, how to go see how important that was. But now he was in another office role and he was asked to prepare a report and he felt really pressed for time. And so instead of going um, out to talk to some of the companies that he knew he needed to, to get firsthand information, he just went to the library. So the big boss, as he called it, asked him to come forward and share his report. And Mr. Yoshino, you know, pulled out his A3 and started talk, uh, saying how, how he went about uh, collecting the information. And the boss said, wait, you didn't go talk to these companies? Time out you know how important it is to go to Gemba to go talk to them. I don't want to hear any more of your report. I will give you one more week and I want you to come back to having done the deepness of thinking that is required. Now, what was interesting is that later Mr. Yoshino found out 
that his boss knew that it was very unlikely that any of the information in the report would change, but that what he wanted to impress upon uh, Mr. Yoshino at that time was the process of learning. So making sure that he had gone to see, he had validated the data he'd collected from the library with facts from going out to see, and that that was the, that was the more important element that he was teaching as a leader, not just the outcome of the report. Uh, that was again very, uh, very profound about how embedded this concept of learning and leader as coach uh, for learning was already at the culture of, of Toyota at the time. And again, we're going to talk more about this at the end, and you can download the coaching questions guide that I've created to help people practice the art of asking questions. And it's so important, um, again, as leaders, we don't, if we come in and, and rush in and give all of the answers, we don't allow, and we give a target, but then come in and uh, just answer what we think is the right answer. We don't allow that time for learning. So again, it's about let, giving that space for people to explore uh, what they're thinking and allow them to get down to and have some time for failure or experimentation and maybe going down a path that you didn't think was the the right way but may may have greater discovery actually and the more that people go through that learning process they're going to be more effective leaders or learners themselves um, a big thing that uh, i think is so important is about focusing on the principle not the tool uh, Mr. Yoshino was played a big role in helping uh, embed A3 thinking at Toyota. And in fact, John Shook credits Mr. Yoshino as his, the, one of the p two main managers who helped teach him about the process of problem solving and using A3 thinking. We are so focused in our translation of the Toyota production system on the visible things, the tools, the formats, the structure, but this is not what is the most important. It's about the thinking process and how it supports learning. Mr. Yoshino tells a story about how uh, he learned this when he was helping uh, coach some senior executives on thinking. And he turned to his boss and said, um, this, this senior manager did not fill out this, the, the, the A3 how I would have expected him. And, the, and his more senior boss, who is one uh, uh, who reported to Mr. Namoto, who was sort of the, the, the Mr. Ono side of the people development of, of Toyota and, and told him it doesn't matter as long as we can see his thinking and it follows the pro thought process, that's what's most important. It doesn't matter how he filled out the form. And I encourage you to think about that as well as like, do we, do, are we more focused on the forms and what the tool looks like than, um, than what the thinking process? And then are we actually doing ourselves a disservice because we're focusing on the wrong, on the wrong thing? And then the, the sixth part is taking an ex, making an extra effort. And this is a story I haven't actually shared with um, in, in any, uh, I don't think in anywhere yet. And it was something that was, it just totally blew me away when I heard about Mr. Yoshino. And this is something that he did just as a manager. It wasn't anything special or required of him. It wasn't part of his job description. But after, so he, one of his roles was to spend four years in uh, California in uh, supporting the Numi plant. And when he came back to Japan, he was given an assignment, and this was in the um, early 1990s, given an assignment in the in Nagoya office. And he, he discovered that the people reporting to him, about 100, were doing just sort of regular office jobs, but didn't have much exposure to anything outside of um, the uh, Japan or even outside of the Nagoya area. And he decided that he was going to create a program that he called uh, the aesthetics program or change yourself and it was this nine month long experience where he uh, gave lectures and wrote articles and took his uh, people out to dinner and, and really coached and developed them but what was more amazing to me was that he found a way to get about I think it was about 22 round trip uh, pairs of round trip tickets for people to go fly domestically or internationally and he got the airlines to donate these tickets and I, I mean, I can't think of many managers who go out of their way like this to make this happen, but he created an opportunity for people to expand their worldview who would never have had that opportunity before. And as we were refle reflecting sort of in the wrapping up stages of, of writing this book, uh, he commented to me that it wasn't necessary, but it was meaningful to my people. 
And that really stuck out to me about how, as if we consider ourselves people-centered leaders, how can we do the small things? And that was actually a big thing, but how can we do small things that isn't necessarily part of our job description or considered necessary, but that can be meaningful? So I challenge us to all think about what are the ways that we can do little things each and every day that um, will have a meaningful impact to help develop and support other people. And then the third part uh, of, of a leader's role is not just develop other people, is to develop ourselves. Uh, and that comes from a source of humility of knowing that we all have opportunities for growing and developing and that, that we aren't the source as leaders or as, you know, as the more senior person, we, we're, it's not about our answer. It's about helping develop other people. And that goes back to this concept of intention, sort of what's our, what's our purpose inside and to have the humility know that we too need to always grow as well. And I've seen that developing, helping develop other people is also a path to helping yourself develop. Uh, when I talked to Mr. Yoshino for the first time in Nagoya that, from that picture with my husband, I asked him about that quote because it was so profound to me. And he, he didn't remember saying this, but then uh, he talked a little bit more about uh, his role in developing John. And then he was aware he was developing his, himself as well. But he said that he had this, uh, this knowledge that he didn't always have the right answer for not just the, the problem that John or whomever was solving, but he didn't always know the right way to show up as, that, uh, as the boss or the leader to help that person. And he had to do his own thinking and reflection on, huh, how can I ask a better question? Or what does this person need to, uh, for me to support them in their learning? And so he was always challenging himself about how he could do that better and more effectively. So I have three practices that I have found incredibly helpful for me to, uh, to develop myself, but also in service of developing other people. So the first I consider it, call, I call it taking an intention pause. So for me, this is about taking just a moment to ground myself in what is my purpose in this moment? And then what are the things I need to do to show up that way? Because so often I've, you know, I've had the experience where I'm, you know, sometimes I'm the, the boss, sometimes I'm the coach, sometimes I'm a, I'm a peer and I'm running from meeting to meeting. And it's really hard to know, like, uh, we get in the habit of like telling and responding and giving our, all of our ideas, which is totally appropriate in some cases, especially when we're there to set the direction or if people, if we're a parent and we need to tell. But in many cases, that habit we've developed isn't in alignment with um, our purpose in that moment. So for example, if our purpose in that moment is to really provide support, what are the things that we need to do to provide support? And, I, and it helps me to take this intention pause to kind of remind myself of, of that role and what are the few key things that I'm gonna do that align myself in that direction with my actions. And that has helped me develop better practices of listening, asking more effective questions, um, not jumping in and interrupting people and so many other things. So this has been helpful for me to create those habits. The, the second thing is to pay better attention to the quality of your questions. So I have uh, more information in the coaching guide here. There are many different types of questions and ways and when you can ask questions. But what I want you to pay attention to is so often we're thinking, we think we're asking a question. That is our intention where we know we should be asking a question in that moment, but that we're actually asking a fake question. So we're asking a leading question or a closed ended question or offering multiple choices, which limit the answers. So I want you to pay attention and think about, are you asking a real humble inquiry question, which is asked for the intention of helping the other person think more deeply about their situation or problem? And typically uh, these questions are those that are start with what or how. So if you can ask a question that starts with what or how, this is more likely a, a real humble inquiry question. Although I do wanna caution you going back to the slide that what if you tried my great idea or what if you tried uh, my thought or how about thinking about whatever I'm thinking about, that is not a humble inquiry question. So pay attention. Oh, I forgot to mention, I'm so used to seeing this animal. This is a weird animal. It's actually a wolf disguised as a sheep. So these are the, our questions dressed, uh, uh, our, our, our thinking, our ideas, our suggestions dressed up as questions. So really pay attention to that. And then how do we listen? Are we really listening um, with open ears, seeing with open eyes, with an open mind and with an open heart? 
Uh, these are drawings done by my, my friend and coaching partner, Karen Ross, and as a key part of what we talk about, you don't, it's not just asking questions, but it's also listening, listening and really hearing without assumptions and getting back to that sense of caring and people-centeredness about what people are saying the things that are obvious and visible and that you're hearing and the things that may not be uh, visible as well. And going back to this concept of failure uh, in, in the last part of the book, we talk about a 10 year long uh, experience, actually a new business venture that Mr. Uh, DM Mr. Yoshino had that was um, pretty, pretty great, but it failed. And uh, it was a hard time for him to talk about but he did reflect that failure isn't failure if you can learn something important you've never could learn elsewhere. And so how do we also have that mentality as leaders and as people about how can we learn from failure? And again, going back to that concept of reflection and to remind ourselves and that, that learning is never perfect and it's never complete. This is the constant PDCA cycle. And I'd like to say that writing a book is never perfect and it's never complete. And I'm having to remind myself that, especially right now I'm in the final editing process and uh, I'm really excited to get the book out to you all so you can really read in detail the stories that Mr. Yoshino, that I've had the privilege of hearing and helping him synthesize and reflect on of his stories of learning and leading with other people as well. So before we move on to questions, I want you to reflect for one moment too about uh, your own intention and that to say one thing that you will practice with intention to become a more people-centered leader. And we would like people to put those in the comments as well. We'd really love to see uh, what, what you're thinking about. And then just my contact information. I love to hear from, from people and connect. Um, all my contact information is here. If you're wanting to practice more people-centered leadership uh, skills and be part of a community, Karen Ross and I offer our K2C2, Karen and Katie's coaching community regularly. And we're doing a special session on listening coming up. And of course, the book's coming out in July. Uh, Pre-order is available now on Amazon, or you can go to the book's website here. Uh, unfortunately, outside of the U.S. right now, the paperback pre-order is not available, but it will be available in all uh, regions that Amazon ships to once um, the book is officially released on July 15th, but the Kindle pre-order is available. So I'm really looking forward to uh, answering your questions and having a dialogue here and a conversation uh, and again, thank you to Mike and to Graham for inviting me to be here and to share some of the stories and experiences uh, that with, with you all. This is the exciting part about finishing a book and moving oh, on right. is now talking you, about you it. You must be so people. ready for that point to actually get it out there and share all this yeah. with people. Uh, I, I am. I'm ready to be uh, not working in the book, yeah. but like yeah. working on and like really hear, hearing mm -hmm. people uh, how the Mr. Yoshino's stories and our shared reflections impact Absolutely. people. But something I didn't share, uh, actually I had this big pivot moment, it was a year ago. It was actually, it was like last June, July, I'd been working on writing the book and had been sitting down and I was just stuck because my original view of how the book would be structured was not what was flowing. And I realized Mr. Yoshino's, his personal story of learning and leading needed to unfold, how it unfolded. And so this is not a how-to book, this is really about one leader's learning journey, but also talks about some really important times in history. Uh, yeah, as absolutely. Well. Um, Mike, I'm going to I'm going to open it up to you now. You've been um, um, sort of hosting the questions, um, so you guys can just engage in a bit of uh, Q and A for the last sort of five or ten minutes. Okay. So I'll, I'll pick out the first question yeah. that came that came up and distracted you, Katie, uh, just so that it <laughs> makes some 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 value. Uh, how do you help leaders who just don't want to stop looking for? They use the word instant pudding, but I guess the quick fix. What, what, mm. what experience did you get from uh, Yoshino-san on that? Yeah, so I would, so pa patience would be the num number one and how, uh, like, I think mean, it's hard. Again, we can't change other people, but we can give them opportunities to see. So I would say, how can you start modeling the way for what that looks like? How do you, uh, how do you ask maybe just a few more questions that, that, you know, help that person also think a little bit more deeply about the, the quick, you know, it may have been a quick fix. How do we slow down just a tiny, tiny bit? So it doesn't happen overnight. Like, you know, I, I work with organizations, especially in healthcare, where it's so used to everything being a, a crisis that needs to be answered now. So when, when I'm working 
when I was in those organizations and now help support them here, it's like, okay, so even if we needed to put a, 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 an immediate solution there, how do we then go back and actually do a little bit deeper problem solving so that we can see is, did we, is that Band-Aid that we put on, did it actually um, have the impact that we thought? And so how do we just little bit by little bit start to get better at doing that? Um, and I think it's just by asking asking some of those those questions and taking some time to uh, understand the impact of the Sounds things. Sounds like it's more of a, an experiential like. thing, helping them go through that experience of learning so that they don't feel they need to jump to conclusions about things. Yes, uh, okay. right. Yeah. And it's, it doesn't happen overnight. What, what did uh, Yoshino-san talk about the, the Japanese belief about failure? It says, is, is, this a, is this, what is the Japanese belief about failure? Is it a Japanese thing or is it a Toyota thing? So I, I don't, he hasn't specifically ever talked to me about if it's a Japanese, uh, a Japanese thing. And in fact, I, I would think in, in many ways, it sort of runs counter to what my experience was about Japanese culture where um, fail, you know, the harikuri, you know, the failure is <laughs> you kill yourself if you failed. And well, you know, ja Japanese culture and Toyota culture are actually very, uh, there's some similarities and some things that are, are that fit together, but some of the things that Toyota did actually I see as countermeasures to elements of Japanese uh, uh, culture and practice. So. I can't answer to what Mr. Yoshino would say about that, uh, but from his experience at Toyota, the company and the people within the company embraced failure in a very different way than perhaps other, or I know in other organizations in Japan um, and in other areas okay. as well. Uh, Christine asked a question. She said, is it just the leader's responsibility to set the challenge? Surely employees should also have a say in shaping the direction so that they have ownership. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm thinking also back to uh, my the, the group that I've been working with here. So yes, and that's the whole. There there should be a conversation and an input, but ultimately the leaders own that decision making of what of what is the direction we're going to go in. Um, but absolutely, and that's a, 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 of engaging in a dialogue to understand the what's going on in the organization and where what um, what's happening, and maybe. The, the people closer to the work set the individual targets that they need to take to be able to move in that direction. But there, there does need to be some knowledge about what, what, do, what do we need to achieve? What's our highest level purpose as an organization? And how do all the things that we're doing connect down to that? If we let everyone just sort of choose what direction they wanna go, we may have a lot of work that's happening, but not in alignment. So yes, there needs to be some engagement and some discussion, and that's what Toyota has done very well with their Hoshin Conry practice of, of talking, you know, there's input at all levels and then it comes back up. And each group is able to set its own targets that it needs to, uh, and goals as it relates to that direction. But again, there is strong alignment there. So I think it's, I would say it's both. But certainly that's been my experience anyway, because there's a full engagement, but not necessarily a, uh, a directional setting from, from further into the organization because they often don't have the full picture. Um, what, uh, Hernan asked, uh, what would you say are the basic organization traits that need to be in place before we attempt to get everybody on board with a new learning organizational culture? So I, I, that's a that's a good question too. I don't I don't think you can wait for everyone to get on board. That's never going to happen. Um, so again, I would say that it's about you can start at, at at any level, but it's about starting to engage people and asking more questions. And how do you uh, at, at leaders at all levels? The more that you can ask those questions and allow people to contribute their thoughts that that will start to develop the learning organization. I mean, if you think back to this, the, the amazing story of, of Numi, and it's you know written about before, I mean, it was the same thing that Mr. Yoshino was tasked at. They had this going into a culture that was where people were, were voluntarily, actively destroying cars and doing, and like, just the, it was a really hor horrible culture. And within one year, they had created those conditions for people to see a different way. And so it didn't happen overnight, 
Um, but again, it's about it's about giving people experiences and also leaders showing up and not blaming them immediately and not um, attack you know attacking personally, but creating a little more space. But I don't think you can create all the conditions that are going to be perfect. It's about it, it grows it grows a bit organically, person by person. What do you think, Mike? Because I know you've had some experience both at Toyota and working yeah, with a lot of other think, organizations too. It's interesting because you. you the way that you put that, I, I'm going to relate that to another question that someone's just put here. Marina's just asked the question, would you put a massive scary challenge or play gently? And and that commit com, comes back to the way that you explain the balancing of challenge and nurturing. And it's, it's a fine line. So for some people, a scary challenge is exactly right for where they need to go to. But then it's the reassurance and the support that fits behind it. But what, what's your experience on that? Uh, absolutely. So if you have uh, if you have just the scary challenge, but not having the nurture element, the, the true people centered leadership aspects, well, that creates a culture culture of fear and and blame and bad things. But if you're only nurture and have no direction or no challenge that allows you to grow and and sort of leap into maybe ways that you didn't think were possible because it felt safe, then are you really sort of pushing the innovation and continuous improvement? So you can't have one without the other to really be a learning um, people-centered organization. So you see those sort of cultures, that, you see two different cultures that maybe you don't I, want when um, I was, out of that. After having left Toyota, I read a really clever book by a guy by the name of Mihaly, she sent me Mihaly called Flow. And in that book, he talks very much around the idea of balancing challenge and support or skills. It's the same thing, really. And, and I never realized it at Toyota, but that's yeah. exactly what they were doing. They'd stretch you and then reassure you, stretch you and reassure you. And so you're constantly yeah. in this in this evolutionary growth. Uh, and, and you enjoy it. You like being in right. that place. Right. Because they know you know that they're never going to like totally have the, the floor fall out from under you, but they're not going to just no. give you the answer right away either. Uh, and so one of the one of my observations about here in the West is we are more uncomfortable with this concept of struggle. So and there's actually been some, uh, I'll have to send you the some articles. Mike Rother had sent these to me about how in Japan, even in elementary schools, they they allow kids to struggle a little bit more before giving the answer before how, uh, the teacher comes in. And we are uncomfortable with that concept of struggle, but struggling is where the learning comes in. But also not struggling where they're gonna like, you know, you're you're you're, you're gonna you know, drown because you know it's it's struggling with nurture. And um, I we need to get more comfortable with having a little struggle, but knowing that there's the support there. Uh, Susan asked a good question. Um, she she uh, commented and said, "Great, great webinar, Katie." Why do you think few leaders exhibit the leadership qualities that you spoke about? That's a that's a great question. I think because we are uh, at least I, I think back to myself and how I've had to really put attention to how I'm showing up because I always have loved helping and develop people. And I think people really do come to work wanting to do the right thing and wanting like come from a place of caring for the most part. There's but that we are so habituated to being the one we're in rewarded for having the right answer or we feel time constraints that we have to get this done now. Um, and so because we have been in creating that habit, sort of we collectively um, enable each other and, and, and that to happen as well. I mean, there's even some Mr. Yoshino, even at this end of his career, this, this boat business failure, he didn't do some of the things he need, knew he needed to do because like do, actually talking to his people about the target and the goal, and he just sort of did it because he felt under time pressure. And so we all have this human uh, habit. We have to put real intention to what is our purpose? What, is, what are we trying to achieve? What's important? And then how are we going to, what are the things we need to do to line up with that and to counter the things that we have, that have been so ingrained in us, in our, uh, in our cultures and in our-, our Someone team. said, um... Look. Just one more question, Mike, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, it said, how do you make time for learning? How do you make sure there's time for learning? Mm. That was from Jane, Jane Wooler. I think that's a great question. Mm. That is a great question. Also, for the rhetorical, how do you not make time for learning? 
Um, and I, it's, I mean, this is, this is the big challenge, right? How do we make the time? We feel like everything is urgent and needs to happen now. But think about how many meetings, if you're in the same organization, you've you know, been in for a few years, you go to the same meeting talking about the same problem over and over again. So we're spending all this time solving for the same problem because we actually haven't taken the time for problem solving. So how can we even, as I said earlier, just take 15 more minutes or to 10 minutes to have some reflection or to ask a few more questions and through that start to create the ca more capability and capacity for, for deeper problem solving. But we're just sort of on this hamster wheel of, of band-aids and, and, and urgency because we're not actually addressing the things that we need to address. That's so, a really interesting uh, one. Um, in it, terms of the poll results, yeah. um, and that really resonates with what people have, have shared with us on that. Uh, in terms of the total amount of time that people spend on those three attributes of being a really, really effective leader, the biggest um, category was between 20 and 40 percent. That scored that scored 36 percent of the vote. Um, so that just really starts telling you that actually the majority of time is spent not doing those things. And how much more effective would people be if they could somehow manage to get another five or 10 percent? Um, that would feel like a profound difference to their teams in terms of being able to lead, um, you know, in, in a different way. What in, it's a, absolutely. I mean, one thing that I, when I work with, with clients in, in, in helping them do this is even just how can you take five to 10 minutes each day, this is their homework assignment, to reflect on the day and set their plan or their intention. And just that small habit of doing that and writing it down starts to create more problem it just creates more focus up here and thinking and it sort of starts to create that habit that then has this sort of a, a ripple effect with the my, people that my they're working with. Well. I think a lot of people get confused with learning. They think that learning is something that you do away from work. But the reality is in my experience with Toyota, all the learning was virtually done on the job. Uh, you know, although there was days that were happening to, mm. to develop new concepts and skills, but all the learning was done on the job, solving problems, making improvements making decisions, working through things. And if the leader is there engaging with people and asking them questions, then you're stretching their learning. Yeah. So, yeah. I just want to say a really huge thank you to Katie again for her time. Um, absolutely fantastic. I mean, you know, just listening to you talking to Mike, you know, we could go on, you know, probably into the early hours, although we, uh, some of the audience in Japan, it already is in the early hours, but you, you know what I mean? Um, so I hope everybody uh, would agree with me that, um, your, your approach and your insight um, is fantastic. I'm really looking forward to seeing the book. Um, so thank you again. Um, and we'll be in thank touch. You. Thank we'll you. Be in touch. Thanks to everybody. Thanks yeah. to everybody out there for dialing in today. Um, good luck to you all. Um, stay safe. Yeah. Look after you. each other in these difficult times. All the best. Goodbye. Okay. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you.